Hi everybody, I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy specialist at the Maine State Library. And this afternoon I'm gonna talk about the genealogy reference shelf and what it's nice to have, what, um, and some things that you probably should have bookmarked. Before I get started, I am going to put, why am I, Oh, I'm in the wrong folder. That explains why. One of the things I am doing as soon as um, my eye doctor takes new appointments is getting my eye. I, I desperately need glasses. And new glasses. So I've put three files in the chat. Um, the first one, the genealogy reference bookshelf is what I'm mostly going to be working from. Um, I tried to put most things in there and with space enough that if you've got, if you print it out, you have room to um, make notes. So let's talk about books first. I mean, we're librarians, so there are three books plus one other that if you don't have, I would highly recommend trying to fit into your budget at some point. Um, I don't really have a favorite intro to genealogy book, but George Morgan's How to Do Everything Genealogy is a good start for most patrons um, and I you know you may have some if you have something else already that's great but I would recommend having a basic and this is in the list um, a basic how to do it book both for your sake and so patrons can take a look at it and see what they're working with. Um, and as I said, I, I don't have a real favorite, but this is probably as close to a favorite of that type of, as what I've got. Um, more advanced, but still really worthwhile. This is the third edition of a book called The Source. It's, it's huge, it's heavy. Um, it's fairly expensive. Um, you could probably get away with a second edition used, especially if it's going to be for you to have um, to look things up so you can help patrons. This is more advanced than the Morgan book by far. Um, and it has chapters on various ethnic groups, different types of records. Um, so it covers um, census records, church records, court records, immigration and land records, newspapers, um, a, a colonial English chapter, which gets you the um, DAR Mayflower Jamestown coverage. Um, but you know, if, if your budget doesn't stretch to a new third edition, it is one where I'd say, you know, Put the second edition in your Amazon cart and see when you can find one cheap to have behind your desk to be the, the thing that you pull out when somebody has a question that you can't answer. Because for the most part, almost, I don't want to say everything you'll come across in American genealogy is in here, but almost anything your patrons are going to ask you will be covered in this, which you know, given that it weighs, I don't know, three or four pounds, is not surprising. For those of us here in New England, this is the Genealogist's Handbook for New England Research, put out by the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And this is really great. It gives a state summary of what's available for that state. And then for every state, let me pull up Maine. 
It tells you when it has a county breakdown, as you can see, here's Kennebec County. And what I really use this for, if I can find it here, it has a chart with the name of the town, when it was organized, what towns it was spun off from, and then what towns spun off from it. Um, and so it's really nice. And it also does things like for Livermore Falls, it has a note that it was called East Livermore until 1929. Um, or, you know, that the town of Lebanon is in York County. It was parts of Sanford and Shapley, and then Shapley took part of it. And so it, it, it helps you trace where boundaries change when towns spun off so that you know to look at the parent town for records. Um, it's just really a handy book to have around for New England. Um, let's see, we've got it. Yeah, you can often find copies of the second edition of the source cheaply. Um, I bought a second copy. I have the third edition. And then because I have up to camp, I found a, I had it on my Amazon wish list and noticed there was like a $7 um with four dollars shipping copy of the second edition i was like you know what rather than me hauling that back and forth i'm going to get a second copy um to take up to camp because yes i do genealogy when i'm up to camp as well um you know and you have to remember on, on that the records haven't changed how we access them has but the records themselves haven't changed and so a book like that, it may not have the latest website for finding something, but it's going to give you the information about what's in the actual records. Now this last one in um, the basics is a little bit of a stretch. This is actually my personal copy because I haven't gotten one for the library yet. I'm going to the next time we have a little surplus. Um, this is, the downside of this one is it's kind of Brit British focused, but given that up until 1783, a lot of what's in here would have been the same for the colonies. It's called Understanding Documents for Genealogy and Local History. And it's by Bruce Dury, who's a like the preeminent, he literally wrote the book on Scottish genealogy. Um, and it covers documents, what's in them, enough Latin to be able to read any records in Latin, um, dates, you know, Islamic dates, Hebrew dates, um, Julian versus Gregorian, all of those sorts of things, weights and measures. Um, it's all in here. And you can usually get a copy of this from Amazon. I did put the ISBN for this one, because at one point Amazon had it with some other weird title. And I could only find it by looking for him. If you put the title in, it didn't come up. But if you put him in as the author, it did. So I did put the ISBN in. And you can often get this at Amazon for about $30. And it's, as I said, it's, it's British focused, but it's going to have a lot that will help with colonial genealogy if you get people coming in for pre-revolutionary genealogy or for British and Irish work. So that's kind of the basics. So, the next pile I'm going to talk about are a couple others that if you've got them, don't get rid of them. Um, it may be worth getting if it's in your budget, but it's not. These aren't ones where I'd say, oh, you really should, you know, you're going to regret not having them. Um, this one is called The Red Book. 
which you know kind of see by the cover um, and it's a lot of information some of it overlaps with the New England handbook but it's for the whole country the advantage to this is it tells you the names of some of the courts around the country so that and gives a lot of lar libraries and archives so you know what to look for the information may not be up to date say on you know the contact information or the website for the New Mexico State Archives, but it, it gives you some idea of what's in that collection and you know, is there a state archives versus the historical society um, and things like that. So this is definitely one I'd say don't get rid of, but you're gonna, in most cases now, this is from, this is the latest edition, if I remember correctly, it's from 2004. So I often end up using this to figure out what to Google to find an answer for somebody. Does that make sense is how I use it? Okay. Um, and this one is the Researcher's Guide to American Genealogy. And again, it, it somewhat overlaps with the source um, in terms of talking about types of records and what records exist and so on. So um, it's one, I tend to go to the source first, but I have occasionally found um, that she explains something better or has a little more detail in one particular area. Yeah, I think the online versions are as up to date because they are there, they are online. Um, they're as up to date as anything like that's going to be, I think. Um, I happen to find the way the source is online cumbersome to use, and that's a personal opinion. But I admit that for some reference stuff, I still like a hard copy book for skimming. Um, just like for some books, I love my Kindle for portability and flexibility and all of that. But for some things, it's still easier to have the hard copy book. And so the red book, I would certainly say, if you know, that's online, use that. But the source, I'd still lean towards saying, if you can get a copy in your budget, it's probably worth it. So next we have what I call the New England collection. Yeah, they really, sorry, let me go back to this. On the source, they really don't make it easy to use online, which is interesting because they're not really pushing the, it's, it's put out by Ancestry and they're not really pushing the um, hard copy either. So I don't know quite what's going on with that. So next I'm gonna do what I call sort of the New England specials that since we're here in New England, these are books that you don't necessarily need to get for your library, but you should know they exist um, so that you can send people to me <laughs> or email me and say, you know, patron needs X or Y. Um, this first one is called New Englanders in the 1600s. A Guide to Genealogical Research published between 1980 and 2010. And the reason I like this one is that prior to 1980, there was a, and actually prior to about 1950, there was a lot of misinformation about early New England settlers. And a lot of it has been cleared up in articles written in this 30 year period as sources became easier to get to, but the old version of things is still floating around. And so um, this is very handy because it gives um, which journal or book updated information is found in. And so it's, if you have somebody come in 
who's looking for information on one of the older New England families, it's worth checking to make sure there isn't re relevant recent research in here. Does that make sense why it's worth you knowing this exists? Um, the main genealogical society in cooperation with Picton Press early on before they went out of business is doing a series called Maine Families in 1790. There are 11 volumes in this. Um, volume three is very hard to get a hold of at this point unless you buy the full set. Um, the idea is to take every family in the main census in 1790 and do a short sketch with, and you probably can't see this that well, with what's known about the family, where they came from, um, the parents of, of the couple, um, the children they had, who the children married, where the person listed in the census died, all of that. So it's, it's trying to capture information about everyone who was in all the families who were in the 1790 census. There's a similar effort being done for Vermont. Um, so this is very handy to um, know that it exists. So if somebody comes in, you know, not everyone's been done yet, um, but it is, if someone's working on a family where this has been done, a sketch has been done, it pulls together all the sources on that family. Now here's an interesting one. This is a set done by a man named Clarence A. Torrey. And it's often just referred to as Torrey. Um, it's New England marriages prior to 1700. And it was his attempt to go through all the various published genealogies, various vital record sets, and find every marriage that happened in what's now New England before 1700. And in 1985, um, the Genealogical Publishing Company published this that's just a summary of his work, um, pretty much without sources. And it gives the man's name, the wife's name as far as it is known, any dates that are relatively firm for the couple, um, and what town or towns they lived in. And that's it. And there is um, an index, but by the women's names because the men's names are in alphabetical order. Um, it's great, but it's not the whole thing. So in 2011, the, the original manuscript for this project is at the New England Historical and Genealogical Society in Boston. And so in 2011, they put out a three volume set that has the sources. And so that's, really helpful to know where Tori got the information. So um, I have recently, be, I think because of the um, getting the, the 2011 set, I have seen some copies of the one volume genealogical publishing set um, for sale really cheaply. And again, that's one of those where if you found a good deal on this, to have it, but know that the State Library has the one with the sources. So if a patron finds something, you could email me or have them email me to get the sources. So next, I have more. The other big New England, and, and this is all, I did not bring all of this into my office. Um, 
the Great Migration Project at the New England Historical Genealogical Society was looking at people who migrated to New England up until the spring of 1641. So from the time the pilgrims came in 1620, so a 21-year period, and because after the spring of 1641, conditions changed in England, so there was no, there was nowhere near as much push for people to come to New England. And in fact, there's relatively little immigration to New England for the hundred years after that. Most people went further south. They went to New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Virginia. So there are a couple incarnations of this project. The first one was a three volume series called The Great Migration Begins. And Robert Charles Anderson, who did this, tried to write a sketch for every person he could find a good source for being in New England by 1633. So this covers the Winthrop Fleet, the Mayflower, the other early Plymouth people, um, early Connecticut people, and so on. And it's really, I think, regarded as sort of the state of the art on those early settlers and whether anything is known about their European origins. Because needless to say, there are people who have tried to make some of the, the very ordinary early settlers, tried to connect them to somebody of a similar name who was high status in England, and so on. So the first three volumes are called The Great Migration Begins, and they go up to, they go from 1620 to 1633. And then there's a seven volume set for 1634 and five which tells you about how things both picked up and how there's more information about some of them. So that's really handy. And then he's made, they've done a couple others. The, the Pilgrim Migration is one volume looking at just those who went to Plymouth Colony from the era of the Great Migration begins, so 1620 to 1633. Um, so only looking at Plymouth and not Massachusetts Bay or, or New Haven, Connecticut and such. Um, and again, these, these books are expensive. You don't necessarily want to get them, um, but it's worth you knowing that we have them here at the State Library. And if you were to happen to see one at a good price. And then he, they did the same thing for the Winthrop fleet of 1629 and 30 um, to Massachusetts Bay. They've pulled those people out in one book. Now, one of the things that is worth knowing, um, one of the things I'm gonna talk about in the bookmarks is the New England Historical and Genealogical Society's website which is AmericanAncestors.org. And you can sign up for a free account and get access to some things. If you have a paid account, and the institutional accounts are, as far as I know, not that horrendous. You'd have to, I don't know if they adjust for library size or not. Um, but all of the Great Migration Project is there. And I think most of Tory is there as well. And so, you're not needing to, um, if you have that access, you don't need to buy those. And it's handy, you know, it's, it's like Ancestry, it's in library use only, but it is a handy thing to know about. So let me finally talk about some that I didn't put on the source sheet that I posted, but just so you know they exist, and um, actually one of these is on the source sheet. This is the first edition of the Blaine Bettinger's Guide to DNA. Um, unlike some of these others where I'm like, yeah, get the previous edition because things don't change that much. This one, if you're gonna buy it, buy the second edition. It came out in 2019 because between 2016, when the first edition was done 
and 2019 in the second edition, stuff changed in the DNA world. Um, I did, one of the things I posted is blogs worth following. And if you're interested in the DNA, a couple of those, um, Blaine Bettinger's blog, The Genetic Genealogist, and Roberta Estes' DNA Explained. If you're interested in DNA work, it's worth having either his book or this one from Pen and Sword called Tracing Your Ancestors Using DNA, which this has all of the examples that tend to be British. It's a British publisher. Um, one of those, and then re, for, the, for the overall comprehensive background, and then reading the blogs to keep up with the current stuff. Um, I'm presuming most libraries today, you either have some kind of style guide in your reference collection, or you've got something bookmarked on the um, on your internet. This is probably way more than most of your patrons would need. This is Elizabeth Schoen Mills Evidence Explained. It's the definitive word in many ways. It's also overkill for most of the people we're dealing with. Um, so, you know, in general, any general guide you have to source in, you know, Chicago, MLA, APA would work. Um, this is a book, um, this circulates, so when we're back to letting you request a book, Feel free to request this one. This is by Rhonda Clark and Nicole Wedemeyer Miller. I disclaimer: Rhonda Clark was my favorite professor in library school. Um, <laughs> she's at Clarion. Um, it's called Fostering Family History Services: A Guide for Librarians, Archivists, and Volunteers. And so, if you're looking to do more with genealogy for in your library or local history. When we start lending books out for van delivery, this is one that is worth taking a look at. Um, I know some of you come to these because you're interested on your own more than for the library. Um, my favorite theory book on sort of genealogical theory and methodology. Robert Charles Anderson, who until recently headed the Great Migration Project when he retired a year ago, um, wrote this book called Elements of Genealogical Analysis, How to Maximize Your Research Using the Great Migration Study Project Method. And he's a little outside of the standard U.S. genealogy theory community, and it's amazing. This is not that big a book, but it's it's dense. There's nothing wasted in here. In, um, but he does a really good job of laying out how to think about does this record that has a person with this name really relate to this other record with this person who has the same name, and is it one person or two? And so this is my favorite sort of getting from beginner or advanced beginner to intermediate with some theory behind the, the research. Um, BJ, what yeah. do you mean when you say he's um, a little outside the standard theory? What do you mean by that? Well, generally most people talk about the genealogical proof standard that's out of the board of certification for genealogists. Um, and he, his, his doesn't necessarily conflict with it, but he uses a lot of different terminology than most people use. He okay. gets to the same place, but by a slightly different path. So maybe another way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Does that make sense? Yes, and I already have that one bookmarked from the last time you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a tough read. 
Um, and if, if you're interested in genealogical theory, I would suggest, I think you're now getting to the point where you can begin to get copies of this at a good price used. It's probably worth getting so you can mark up. I had to mark my copy up to keep track of what he was talking about. And the last one I'm going to talk about before I go into a little bit about bookmarks. Um, again, this is one so you know we have it. Um, it's called Following the Paper Trail, a multilingual translation guide. And it covers mostly Eastern European languages, although not completely. Um, and it goes through with word lists, like here's a German word list um, in both modern script and the old frock tour. Um, they give examples, as you can see here, of what a certificate's going to look like. Let me find a nicer one than that. So, you know, here's a sample certificate. You can see. Um, and I'm pretty sure this one's out of print, um, but it covers Latin, German, Polish, Russian, Spanish, Czech, Hungarian, Lithuanian, French, Italian, and Swedish. So it's a very handy book. If, but again, it's knowing that we've got this here. If, if you get stuck, you, you can email me and I will try to figure out what you've got. So let's take a look. If, um, I'm going to share my screen at this point. Um, so this is what I sent you. Um, let me stop my video so you don't get the side of me as I turn here. Most of these I've mentioned at some point or you're going to know about, but if um, Family Search is the Family History Library, the, the Mormon LDS site. The wiki, which I've put in bold, um, you definitely want to bookmark. Both Family Search and American Ancestors, you get much more access if you create a free account. Everything at Family Search is free. American Ancestors does have memberships that get way more access, but even a free account gets you more than. Um, not signing in. They want your email address. National Archives, Library of Congress, then Chronicling America is a project of the Library of Congress around newspapers. Um, I'm presuming most of you have heard of the Digital Public Library of America. Um, Steve Morse's Utilities is about the, the two big things is he's got utilities for searching multiple passenger list sites at once and figuring out enumeration districts for census records when you have an address in the US. Um, Cindy's List is the huge website with categories so of curated links. Um, this New York City Italian genealogy records index is, is deceptive. It was the Italian Genealogical Society that did it, but they indexed everything they could get their hands on, not just those that were Italian names. Roots Chat is an online bulletin board um, with, and most of the sub boards, say for English counties or Canadian provinces have people who really know those locations. I've talked about Find a Grave. Um, Archive.org, despite their little mishap recently with copyright issues with recent books, is still a really good source for pre-1924 family histories. Um, Digitalmain.com, 
slash newspapers is, is the state library's attempt to digitize Maine newspapers. Fulton History has newspapers heavily New York State, but they also pick, you get newspapers that pick things up from further away so that you will get little blurbs about news out of Maine or New Hampshire. And then um, Januki is the UK and Ireland genealogy website that is kind of, is very similar to the Family Search Wiki in that you can go down by geographic unit and find what's available. So that's one of the things I put in the chat. Um, let me stop sharing for a minute. Well, I pull up something else. So, let me open. It's not what I wanted to open. So let's take a look. I'm going to share my screen again. And, and if I could type, we'd be in. So Blaine Bettinger, um, blogs is the genetic genealogist and he does, he hasn't posted much recently, but it is worth keeping up with what he does post a fair bit about, um, genetic genealogy, although he's doing a lot more, um, the Facebook group genetic genealogy tips and tricks these days. So if you're on Facebook and interested in genetic genealogy, that's probably the, the place to go. The legal genealogist will go there. Judy Russell is amazing. And um, does a talks a lot about both the, how the law works in terms of us researching, you know, privacy issues and so on, and how the law affected our ancestors' lives and looking at how the records our ancestors generated were influenced by the law at the time. So, um, that's a, she's really, she knows her stuff and she's really good. Um, so I, she's one I follow quite seriously. Um, let me show you just a couple others. Um, ah, why is he doing that? Um, this is the blog from the New England Historical and Genealogical Society slash American Ancestors. And it's written by lots of their um, employees. So it's not one person. Um, writing, but it's um, very New England focused. So it's, it's good that way. One of my other favorites um, Lara Diamond writes really good stories about her family and how she found what she found. 
and weaves interesting information in amongst what she's found. So she tells really good stories. And the last one I wanted to share was this one. Um, Roberta Estes, um, DNA Explained, also tells really good stories around what she's found. And as you can see, she really does, I mean, she does incredible research. Um, so it's, it's interesting to follow what she's been doing. So that's just a quick look at some of the things that Um, I use routinely as I'm helping people. So, any questions? Um, so, yes, BJ, um, I'm wondering, and I see there when we went from Marvel to the digital main library, because um, in Marvel there used to be the historic newspapers. Um, in your list, I'm wondering, is that now switched over to just the, uh, the digitalmain.com through the um, Main State Library? Is that from Marvel or is this just a whole separate oh, thing? That's, that's the State Library's project to digitize Main newspapers. Okay, because I just noticed that uh, the historic newspapers were no longer available in like, from when yeah. switched from Marvel. We, we have but you guys Sorry. have to do the main state library. We have one that you can access from our computers. And you can also access a lot of historic newspapers, although not much for Maine, other than pretty much the full run of the Lewiston Sun Journal family from My Heritage. And My Heritage also has Massachusetts newspapers from the 1700s until a few years ago. Okay, but for old Maine newspapers, really your digital Maine common. Uh, yeah, that's, that one is the best one. Okay. Cool. At this point, um, it's still not as good as I'd like, but we're getting there. It's um, a process. The the Belfast paper, for example, from eighteen twenty nine through. 1922 is available from their website, for example. Um, they had a grant to do the 1829 to 1868, and so that's at one location. And then the 1869 to 1922 was a different grant, so that's at a different location, but you can get to both of them from their website. Thank you. And you know, we're, we're trying to get those things onto one page. And I think one of my coworkers has updated that page, which is the one that's in the handout. Um, so, but yeah, some of this was to just show you some of my favorites, the things I use frequently. Um, and you know things like you know somebody is collating the information of the genealogies written in the last 40 years to correct the mostly 19th century stuff that wasn't very good so i'm going to stop the recording at this point oops if i hit the right button